Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, our reading for today is um, a bit of a difficult one, but it includes uh, and concludes the book of Zechariah, and it has a epic march into Jerusalem. Now, in the ancient world, and still for many today, marching is martial in nature. You march so that an army can move in an organized and unified fashion. It's one thing to drill and practice, but on the day of the big battle, a lot is riding on what will take place. The anticipation, focus, and nervous energy build as you march into conflict. In Zechariah's book, the momentum and fervor ramps up throughout the book until we get to this final march in the closing chapter. Kind of like the end of a good summer blockbuster movie, the end of Zechariah is filled with all kinds of tensions and questions. It's good that the temple is being rebuilt, but the rebuilt temple is not really all that good. The people have returned to Jerusalem, but they have not returned, or at least not with all their hearts. Yahweh promises to restore the Davidic kingship, but the governor, Zerubbabel, is not really a king. Plus, throughout the book, Zechariah has a dizzying amount of visions, and some are quite positive, while others are devastatingly dark. Of course, these tensions are not ones that Zechariah has created out of thin air. Zechariah chapter 14 contains the tensions of the entire Old Testament. It's the frustratingly hot than cold nature of Israel's relationship with Yahweh. It's the broken line of David, the uncertain presence of God with his people following the exile. In general, as we read through the Old Testament, it really does not read like a fairy tale at all. There is no happy ending at the end of the Old Testament. In fact, things have been going downhill for quite some time at this point. Maybe that's part of why we, we don't read these sections of the Scripture quite so much. But it might help us to remember that Zechariah we could classify as apocalyptic literature. Um, it's focusing on the future is one part of that word apocalyptic. Now, most people hear apocalyptic and think the end of the world, right? But in a biblical sense, it's more like the end of the world as we know it. There will certainly be some things that go away or are destroyed, but there will also be new and better things. In fact, far from being a bad picture, the scripture tells us that the end of the world as we know it is a good thing. For one, our hearts and minds will no longer be twisted. Evil will be defeated and the devil will be forever gone. Now, this is sometimes perhaps uh, a bit of a challenge for us, or maybe at certain times of our life, it's harder to kind of grasp. But when you're sitting pretty, when things are going well, the end of the world sounds like a bad thing. <laughs> but when life stinks, when something, then something dramatically new and different is like oxygen to a man running out of air. Life, the scriptures tell us, and we sometimes experience, can be full of pain and hardship. What's more, from a Christian perspective, the world is idolatrous, selfish, and nasty to one another. And sometimes, uh, in some places, especially so to Christians. We need resolution. Sometimes we do need something drastically different than the current world, and Jesus offers it. Now, apocalyptic language is is uh, intentionally extra dramatic, and it's used to describe something fantastic. Now, it's helpful to kind of understand this. It's more concerned with communicating concepts or ideas than giving a precise play-by-play -play of everything that's going to happen. Sort of, it, it's maybe helpful to think like an artist. It's sometimes more about capturing the feeling or the gist of what's going on, uh, often using symbolism and signs, because it, it does this because it's, what it's trying to communicate is a challenge to communicate. So it's got to be creative. It's sometimes more appropriate to think a little abstractly and less woodenly. 
Well, Zechariah chapter 14 is filled with apocalyptic language, and all the language is used to describe something to us, but it may not be quite exactly that these literal things are going on. And, and especially if we take the gospel uh, accounts, it seems quite likely that it's not necessarily meant to be all literal. Um, it certainly is, though, the end of the world as we know it, and that's what this language is trying to evoke in our imaginations. Chapters, Zechariah's chapter 13 and 14 are talking about a new era referred to as the day of the Lord. Now, this day is a momentous day, and in some ways it's a terrible and cataclysmic day. The word day is probably used by Zechariah uh, in part because it can be used fluidly. It can mean specifically one day, but it can also mean uh, at times a specific time period that might be more than 24 hours. A lot depends on context. For instance, someone, we still use the word day this way sometimes, like someone says, well, that's not how it was in my day. They don't necessarily mean 24 hours. They mean back in maybe their heyday or in a certain time period. Um, well, that's sometimes, again, it, a lot depends on the context of how the word's being used, but that's sometimes how the word in Zechariah 13 and 14, the day of the Lord, is sometimes more of an era, uh, and then sometimes it seems like it is specifically a day. Well, last week's sermon, we took place uh, on what Zechariah referred to as the in my day, or what Yahweh might refer to as in my day, or that Zechariah calls on the day of the Lord. We learned that that day was both good and bad already last week, a day of betrayal, of God being stabbed in the back. However, it was also a day when God would cleanse the land of idolatry, a day when God's people would mourn and repent over sin, and Yahweh's Spirit would return to his people. So some good certainly would come of it as well. The gospel writers connect all these things with Jesus' passion as the day of the Lord. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14 adds, it tells us that this will also be a day of battle, of casualties, but also a day of rescue. And that's perhaps the point that we might miss if we get too caught up in all the details. Again, think action movie. Uh, all the bad guys have come for one final showdown with the hero or the heroes. Both sides grow eerily quiet and strain their ears to listen to the epic dialogue between the good guys and the bad guys about the battle that's going to take place. And that's kind of what's happening in the beginning of in this section of Zechariah. Yahweh begins taunting the enemies of God's people after they have taunted him. Even, and he says, even though he's telling them exactly what he's going to do, there's nothing they're going to be able to do to stop him. He says, the Lord will stand on the Mount of Olives against the abusive and terrible enemies of God's people. He stands on the Mount of Olives because he's about to march into the city. And Zechariah says it will be a dark day, um, but also a day when light will break through unexpectedly. It will be a day also that living water flows out from Jerusalem to the whole earth. And on that day, Yahweh will be king. There's, there's too much to be said about all this and can't, unfortunately, uh, cover it all in one sermon. But the living water certainly sounds a lot like what Jesus says in the Gospel of John. And also, as we see, um, Jesus is side pierced and blood and water flowing out. And it's from the, the blood of Christ um, and, and from being baptized into his name that we do receive uh, forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. But fast forward to the end of the chapter for the time being, and we see what has amounts to an astounding reversal of fortunes. Uh, you see, the nations, which at the beginning of this chapter were oppressing and attacking Jerusalem, or taunting and mocking God's people, Yahweh and his people, like they were doing currently in Zechariah's day, suddenly that's no longer happen, happening. Instead, the nations are showing reverence to Yahweh. Those who have trusted in Yahweh will be vindicated and lifted up. 
while those who have set themselves against him will be punished. Jerusalem, currently scorned, will in fact become so holy that everything that touches it practically will become holy. In fact, it gets down to this. Every porridge pot in every kitchen cabinet in Jerusalem will be holy to the Lord. It's, it's extreme. It's uh, almost ridiculous, the, the, the language that's used. And no longer will there be a traitor, which is, you know, a Gentile really is, uh, it's talking about um, those who are not from Jerusalem. No longer will a traitor uh, be occupying the temple, but rather the temple will be filled with people who aren't necessarily Jewish, converts of the nations who have now traveled to Jerusalem. Those who used to travel to Jerusalem to attack it are now traveling to Jerusalem to worship there. Well, the, again, the gospel writers uh, are regularly quoting from Zechariah and alluding to it so that obviously they think that we can see this day as taking place in Jesus' passion and crucifixion. Uh, before both Palm Sunday and Jesus' arrest, Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives because there is an impending showdown. Even though the nations taunt him at his trial and at his death, Jesus will be vindicated. Jesus, in fact, is being made king. Jesus repeatedly says boldly, let's go. The scriptures must be fulfilled. I've got a job to do, and I will accomplish it. He is going to war. He wages wars, war with the enemies of God's people, both the betrayer among his own disciples, as well as the Sanhedrin, and the leaders like Herod and Pontius Pilate. Although it looks at some points like Jesus may be a victim, he continues to face his enemies uh, with courage and as if he is actually in control of the situation. And certainly, as we think about a reversal of fortunes, what a reversal of fortunes will come about on that day of the Lord. This day, a cold and dark day, the day of Good Friday, but also a day with surprising light as the darkness is lifted following Jesus' crucifixion. Those who were once God's enemies, even the, the very centurion who is in charge of killing Jesus says, surely this was the Son of God. That is the reversal of fortunes. Certainly the crucifixion of the Son of God is a horrendous shock, but it is also the day of God's victory. The day in which Yahweh defeats his enemies, uh, but not only individuals or nations, but the real enemies. Sin, death, and the devil, which are forever extinguished. Now we, too, who were once enemies of God, we return every year at Passion Week to Jerusalem in awe and reverence to worship Yahweh, who, is who sent his son to be crucified, but who is now king of the whole earth. And because of this, we are welcome to be in God's presence, even though we were once alienated from him, even though we once, through our sins, attacked our Lord and Savior. But God has reversed our fortunes, and he has made us right through the death and resurrection of Christ. The crucifixion of Christ is, is a great and terrible day of the Lord. There is death and sorrow but there is also repentance and renewal, a day of surprising victory for God and his people, the day in which Yahweh is crowned as our true king. In Jesus' name, amen.